All right, thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay back there? All right, great. I'm Jay Young. I'm relatively new to the AFSR and on the PM jobs. Now it's about nine months. And uh, I'm an IPA from the Ohio State, and I'm a psychology professor there. Here is a, a brief description okay. of my portfolio. I'm managing uh, three programs, and they are related to one another, you will see. So listed down here. And basically, I am support research in human cognition and decision, which is the, the first one in this list. And also, I support research in computational and machine intelligence. It's, it's, uh, in, in other words, it's uh, artificial intelligence. That is the down here we call the robust computational intelligence. And then the, uh, the second in the list, that's anything between human-machine interface. All in the context of complex problem solving and decision making. So the decision making is the, uh, the theme running through all three programs. So uh, this is a roadmap showing my strategy for the three programs. So the basic premise is that um, the intelligent behavior, whether it is a human or machine, and is, is a result of ex executing computational algorithm. And that's the, my starting point, a basic philosophy of this program. So as you can see here, we view the mind as an adaptive, meaning that self-learning computational algorithm, which is the software running on the brain, which is the hardware. So that this is a human cognitions and machine intelligence, and this is a basic starting point. So that, the, um, that means that in order to study or understand an intelligent behavior, what is a human and machine, we need to figure out the underlying computational algorithms, which is basically mathematics. And sometimes looking at the hardware, which is the brain, and helps to figure out the underlying computational algorithm where the neurosciences comes in. So as you can see this here, I'm a strong true believer of multidisciplinary research. We need the cognitive science that identify the mind's invariance from the experiments. So we need to run the experiment, learn about how human, uh, human do. And then we need the computer science that develop computational algorithms of intelligent behaviors will give you, provide the candidate computational algorithm maybe you can take advantage of. And then the neuroscience tells us about the neural hardware. So as you see, the rest of the, this presentation, I'm trying to bring these things in together, computer science and cognitive science and neuroscience. So to be more concrete, um, here's some example computational algorithm I'm gonna be talking about this very briefly. So the starting point is that uh, for any adaptive intelligence system, and basically we can see that this is the uh, the problem needs to be solved. First of all, the adaptive system must extract useful information out of the massive raw data. So for example, in vision, and um, if we first you need uh, photosensitive cells in the retina can, can extract the information out there, but maybe not entire spectrum of the electromagnetic waves, at least you know, the visible lights. So this is the first step. So in the brain, that would correspond to sensory processing. And then once the information is extracted, and then from there, you need the actionable knowledge. It means that you need to further extract information that's useful for the task at hand. For example, if you're driving a car, it might be important to detect the velocity and the, the direction of the moving object, but maybe not necessarily the shape and the texture of this object. So this is what I mean by action of knowledge. From there, you need to process and to make a decision. For example, do you want to slow down your car or accelerate it or swap to the left or right? So this is uh, so one whole sequence is what I mean by the algorithms. So the down here, some of the example computational algorithm, and I'm going to be talking about a little bit, but just briefly, so for example, so that if you're interested in computational neuroscience, and then that you might want to come up with a neural information processing algorithm. They basically, in a sense, can be viewed as an optimal balance between representation you have to encode, so the brain can process the information. Of course, later, you have to recover the original information, which is the decoding part. The question is, how do you optimally allocate encoding versus the decoding? So that because you want to preserve information at the same time, you'll be able to compute this efficiently decoded later. At the same time, that if you make a causal Inferences, for example, 
So trying to influence, for example, particular op product is uh, poisonous or not poisonous. You're trying to make inference. From there, you make decision. You have to make an optimal balance between prior knowledge, is what you know about this, the world out there, and then particular evidence you have at hand. And that is oftentimes we use the Bayesian algorithms for that. But the, and then the last one here is that if you're trying to make a prediction, what's going to happen? Like whether prediction or whether this person is going to do what? And then this is where that, again, you have to make an optimal balance between past observation, what you know about this particular person or agent, and then what actually could happen in the future. So these are the example of the problem that the human face or intelligent system face. What I mean by this is complex problem solving and decision making. And this is what made the way approach is that, well, every problem must be solved, but the human intelligent agents, you have to have a computational algorithm. So this is where mathematics and formal modeling comes in. So before going to specific examples, I want to briefly spend time uh, about this program trends. So the, my three programs can be subcategorized into these nine sub-areas. So the, some of this program, for example, the memory categorization reasoning. I'm going to stay afloat. And uh, this is a traditional cognitive science because we, we need to learn about the human so that these more experimental approaches and they will stay there as it is. And then the optimal planning, control, reinforcement learning. This is another traditional machine learning. It's important, the areas. And then um, and the down here, these are the four areas. And I'm emphasizing, and then there will be the focus of the next few years. So that basically this is a Bayesian machine learning algorithm for the causal inference or inductive inferences. And then uh, neural based so cognition decision. This is an important area I'm highlighting. And then uh, computational cognitive neuroscience. And then uh, these are also about the human intelligence and for machine, computational intelligence, computational principles on, and methodology of machine and uh, the computational intelligence. So, and then uh, these areas, the cognitive architectures and then the system software. And uh, we, we used to cover at least my programs but uh, I'm de-emphasizing because the other DOD agent is picking up on this. And also, the, uh, the, my colleague at the OSR, uh, they, they, are, they are covering this. So as you can see here, to sum up, I'm emphasizing my new full seek can be, can, be, uh, can be viewed as a two. One is the computation aspect and machine learning, in particular, Bayesian approaches. Second one is a neuroscience understanding. So that means if you one word, there is, I'd like to emphasize, it will be computational cognitive neuroscience approaches. And you're going to see some of the examples. All right, as I, as I mentioned earlier, so I'm managing three programs. So what I'm going to do the rest of the presentation, I'm going to tell you a bit more about this each program and with the one slide. And then highlight what I consider to be the most exciting project under that program and, and an example uh, research projects. So this is the first program. It's called the Mathematical Modeling of the Cognition and Decision. And forget about this, uh, this number. And this is the uh, internal uh, the, uh, the accounting number. I didn't know I'm not supposed to put it there. So that the goal of this program is that advanced mathematical formal modeling of a human cognition and decision an example of human performance is attention, memory, categorization, reasoning, and inference, planning, and decision. Is, is, this is not, not an exhaustive list. Okay? And then the, the strategies and challenges are we seek computational algorithms for adaptive human intelligence inspired or based on the brain sciences because the human brain is the most amazing computation machine so that uh, this is where the neuroscience can, can help play. But my program, per se, is not a neuroscience program. So that's a neuroscience inspired base. That's, that's a better way to characterize it. So obviously, this requires multidisciplinary efforts, cognitive science, mathematics, computer science, statistics, and neurosciences. So my portfolios cover about 50 or 60 PIs, and, and they are the discipline of the places. I have engineers and computer science, mathematicians, statisticians, and neuroscience, of course, psychologists. So I have about four slides just highlighting this one program, Cognition and Decision. And I have decided to pick out this, the Professor Aura Lazar and, and just an example of this particular uh, the, uh, the program focus. And uh, 
He's an electrical engineering professor at Columbia, and he studied the neural basis of cognition. And um, he is one of those who answering or attacking the most important, at the same time, most challenging problems in the study of the mind, which is how the brain process information. And this is the holy grail in neuroscience. So uh, the, um, and uh, why this is an uh, exciting and challenging problem? Because we know a lot about the neurophysiology, so neuroscience and brain, we, all the way down to, say, synapse and neurons, even biochemical process, calcium of calcium channels. And, and if we go to a neuroscience meeting, I was there for 30,000 people came, and there's a lot of work going on there. But also, the whole area of psychology, cognitive psychology, according to science, we know a lot about the human cognition, decision, human behavior. Thousands of experiments done every year. Okay? So we have here one here, the brain. The other side is, is, is the behavior. And just between, there's a huge gap. This gap is as wide, as deep as the Grand Canyons. So that one way to fill this gap is computational approaches, where this computational kind of neuroscience come in. And, and he's one of those who, who, who try to fill this gap and from this engineering point of view. So th this is where he began his enterprise, so that he will build mathematically rigorous computational theory of neural processing based on or inspired by uh, signal processing. He's a signal processing W professor. So that his mathematics comes from signal processing literature. At the same time, based on the known biology of the brain. So this is where these two things come in, neuroscience and natural engineering. So he would build rigorous computational theory. At this point, it's a theory. That's not necessarily brain theory. And then, then he will simulate this theory on computer and see, see how much you can learn about how the brain works. Okay? So that uh, he will use these models, Hoskin Huxley models of single neuron computation and they won this Nobel Prize, so that basically they come up with the four or five equations that describe exactly what happens. So that here you can see the little, uh, little star, that's like a single neuron. So you can see that this is a synapse and dendrite tree. They're talking to one another. What this neuron is doing is that they gener generate series of spikes. So this is a neural spikes that generate. There's like a four neurons are generating. So that how this, each of these neurons can generate spike. This is so the complete understanding at this point. I should say complete because this model is pretty, pretty good. So that this mathematics is already known. So this is his starting point. So he will build, he'll bring this together, lots of hundreds of thousands of neurons. Each neurons will, 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 will generate the spikes. And then the second uh, starting point to his enterprise is this notion, this is his current sort of accepted paradigm, say, that cognition or perception is an end product of neural computation. Meaning that, suppose you hear this is experiment so that you can run this with uh, the cat. So while this cat is looking at this uh, slanted the bar, it can move, it can up and down. At the same time, you can measure this. So what is that basically this information, this uh, visual signal, transform into series of pulses, neural pulses. Of course, there's lots of neurons here. So this Another signal is transformed into digital signal because the digital signal, that is a signal that brain can understand and process. So that's the first part of the information, trans information transformation. Okay, the question is, whatever that the cat is looking at, is seeing or thinking, is, is in contained in here. Right. So the big question, but, but at the end, okay, so this is a specific scientific question that he is attacking. The, the question is basically this, uh, this one. What is a neural code? The given that we know how to measure, even we can measure 500, 600 neurons, single cell recording can be done. But that does not mean we know what the brain is doing, what, what, what this person is thinking. The question is, from this, can you actually recover cognition from neural spike data? So this is like an inverse problem trying to do. Of course, we do this all the time, at the, even, even at the moment, for example. So he, he built a complete theory from the encoding part, which will translate the analog signals outside signal into neural spike using the Huxley and Hoskin network model, neural models. And from there, he will see what he can recover the original images that what is presented to this computer simulators. So that's his approaches. So uh, just basically that based on these two specific hypotheses, he assumed that it's the neural idea of the neural population hypothesis. In other words, it's not the single neuron that encode information, you have to look at the population of neurons. So they're looking at the single neurons, see what the spike pattern, what the statistic does not tell you much. Because you look at the whole population neuron, because the neurons is doing 
process information as a group. That's the first population coding hypothesis. And the second is, as, as alluded earlier, so that basically what the brain is, is the first part sensory encoding, is a, is a, can be viewed as analog and digital converter in the early sensory part. And the later part of the brain basically trying to recover the analog original signal from the digital. So you can see this is uh, the inkling of this uh, signal processing person. That's his background. So that this is, uh, this is uh, the diagram showing that or whatever that Analog signal, this could be image, also colored, converted into uh, this, uh, the digital signal. This is where we use the Huxley and Hoskin models. And then in, in this case, actually, he used the video data. So this is not just toy demonstration. He actually presented a network with actual video streams. And, uh, and, then, and, and then this is the first part of the early part of the use of his models. And the second part from this, you must recover the, what was the original video stream. So this is a massive undertaking, and he has a complete theory and proved the theorems so that this is information preserving, analog to digital, digital to analog processing, this whole non new transformation. So the mathematics is, is quite challenging. So, uh, so this is uh, it's supposed to be video stream uh, demonstration, but unfortunately um, um, I could not, so I can simply show that here's the original images. It's supposed to be a 30 second video. And, then, and this is the, uh, the, the recovered video stream, okay? And, uh, and, and then there's the, the difference between. So they can see that whatever the original information, video image data is, can be coded into digital signal and later can be recovered fully from the digital to analogs. And so uh, as I can see, this is the first ever demonstration of the natural scene recovery, even video streaming images. So this is one sort of existence proof that what could actually do, brain might do. We're not necessarily saying this is the brain work, but this is one starting point. And once you build this model, it's showing that it, it works, and you can do a lot of small things, experiment this and that, and this is trying to bring this to more close to brain. So that is his next step. Okay. So um, that was the, uh, the, the first program, and um, as you can see, I have uh, a lot more PIs, but I decided to just focus on one PI, highlighting this uh, cognition decision program. Now this is a second program. It's a human system interface and robust decision making. Put in another way, this is about the human and machine interface. So the goal here is that we want to advance research on mixed human and machine system in, in, the, in the case of communication, prediction, and planning, or scheduling, and decision making. Here's an example of a situation where that, that human must inter interfere with interface with the machine. And, uh, so the, again, the challenge strategy is that uh, we seek the competition principle for optimal symbiosis between mixed human and machine interactions. And, and the approach is statistical machine learning approaches. So this is not experimental approaches. We're looking for computational or theoretical computation principles. So um, I have about a dozen uh, uh, the PIs on this, but I decided to highlight this one, uh, one, one example is uh, Professor Thomas Griffiths. He's a psychology professor, and uh, that he is a rising young star, is that uh, he already won um, IP, Young Investigator Program, but also he won this uh, couple others, highly prestigious society, Young Investigator Award. He's uh, one of those uh, sort of lookout person for computational cognitive science, you may call. So this particular project, supported by uh, my program, and so here's an example. Suppose that here's a sort of a line, alien objects, for example. You were told that these, we're going to call this is a too fast, like arbitrary name were given. We say these are like a poisonous, right? So that you were told that these are called two bars. And then later we ask, okay, given this, and then what are you going to call this? Is, is it two bars or not, for example? So this is what I call inductive inference problem. From the specific example, you were told what it is, given that now present a new one, what is it then, for example? And then, uh, so, uh, so here's the examples. He would, he would run the experiment with the human participant and, and, and give some hints about small instance. And, and then, of course, there's a, there's a computer program could generate this example instance and to see what actually a human be able to recover the underlying hidden kind of categorical structure. So this is inductive inferences. For example, we are very good at it. So that when, when you're growing up, you know, you're, you're told that this is a dog and this is a border collie and, and then also animals. So you will just give me a few examples. From there, you construct the whole this uh, taxonomical trees. So that the challenge is that 
Humans are very good at it. We just need a few examples, and we can generalize from there, and then I can, can be able to tell what the new object looks like. Is it animals or plant, or what is it, the mammals, and so on. So the, in this project, he want to understand how people can actually do this fast, flexible, rational, inductive inferences. Okay? So he first want to run the experiments, and, and then from the data, he want to build computational models to simulate the human performance. So I did say, because humans are so good at it, you don't need thousands, hundreds of examples, you just need a few examples. Then once we figure out this computational algorithm can account for human data, maybe you can translate into the actual, the theoretical, the computational algorithm can actually use so that this uh, man and system interaction cases, for example, you know, maybe UAV may collect you know, the barge of the data, so that maybe this computational algorithm do pre-sorting, say that this is the enemy, this is not enemy, these things, and then human can deal with that. So that sort of, this is sort of surrogated brain you can build. So uh, the way you approach it is that he, this is the example of the Bayesian algorithms, you approach it from the base, so that this is uh, this, uh, this sort of current state of the art. His starting point is that the non primitive Bayesian models, so idea is that um, just present this, uh, this a series of this uh, stimuli. It could be image or arbitrary letters. And this algorithm looking at this and sort of trying to identify underlying sort of the elemental features. Okay, so for example, letter F. The question is, is the letter F is itself is in one element, elemental features, or maybe it's made of the verticals or horizontals on this. The question is, what makes this the letter F in the context of other letters, for example? We then need to figure that out. And so this Bayesian, non primitive Bayesian algorithm can actually do that. So, so he's one of this, uh, the early pioneers who developed this non primitive Bayesian models and algorithms for this kind of problems. So um, the experiments he ran, basically this is a multi-level category learning task. So here's an example of this. So that, for example, you were told that this is a fox and this is a dog and that is a bear, but sometimes you're told that, well, these are just mammals, okay? And sometimes you say, well, these are North American mammals versus, say, Arctic mammals. So that sometimes it tells you that, you know, sometimes give you the very lowest level of category information is given. Sometimes you say, well, he's just an animal, for example, right? So you would give it a few example instances, just like how we learned these taxonomical structures. So he would run the experiment, because instead of using actuals, the images of animals, they use some nonsense, sort of invented uh, nonsense because you want to control these uh, similarities so that, for example, we're told that these four objects that we're going to call that SOM, S-O-M, give an arbitrary name. And then we're going to call this one different color, different shape called FAC. And that also that belongs to, and then of course these are all going to call this together is, say, TIS, TIS, for example. And then by the, everything in here is called like a VAD. It's like this is called animal and plants, okay? So these are complete hidden structures the subject need to figure it out. They're so that they will, once in a while we generate the example of this and then we're gonna call what well, that's called the SOM, but sometimes the same thing called as a VAD, for example. So it gives like a few trials, like a 50 or 60. And so from there, of course, there's not complete information is there. From there, you need to go from specific few examples. You have to build entire hidden underlying structures, just like that. And we want to know how the human do that. We are very good, humans are very good at it. So with this artificial task, it turns out humans are very good. And they're about, so that once, once they have an individual instance were given, and later they were told that what was the actual structures, underlying hidden hierarchical structures. Now about 80% of the subject, they were successfully built complete hidden structures. So that means 80% of them, they're very good at. You just need a few examples. So, from this uh, data, and he built a model, which is non parametric Bayesian model I mentioned earlier. So that down here is uh, showing the simulation of this model. So this uh, horizontal axis, number of examples shown in each cases. For example, I'm gonna show the four example of this category, or 20 or 60, 80. And then this is uh, the how open you can actually build this, recover the complete this hierarchical taxonomic structures. So you can see that more example given, and more, you can cover higher. So then here's a parameter, so this is R parameter. This is a simulation, so that this R is simply uh, specified to the extent that uh, how much we pay attention to fine details. For example, do you really care about this color or the shape or particular aspect of this? So that is the models, and it turns out this, uh, this prediction from the R equal to three, that is, uh, is uh, this one, and that captured the human performance. So that means here's a, 
So based on the human experiment and the data, he builds this model that accounts for human data pretty well. And then, then, and this maybe could be incorporated into the later when you build a computational algorithm for human and machine interactions. So that was just one example I wanted to highlight. And uh, that was the second, and then the last, the third program I'm managing. And this is called the Robust Computation Intelligence. And this is a, there's no humans here, and basically it's about the computational, so machine intelligence. But bio-inspired, inspired by the, uh, the brain. So again, we, we, we seek for computation principles and methodologies for building and understanding autonomous systems, just like a human do. So what I'm going to do is that um, I'm going to highlight the two projects. One is and tell you about robotic agents. Somebody built robotic agents and algorithm and can actually simulate it in real world environment. This is how robot can actually learn, adapt a new environments. And the second is the, the human, uh, human experiments, trying to understand this uh, computation intelligence, uh, of course, in the brain. So uh, I'm doing okay on time, I guess. So that the first uh, the project, this is uh, Professor Paganako, and he's at Downey, Australia, University of New South Wales. And uh, so, uh, <coughs> so this is an example of automated reasoning by robotic agents. And this is on the robot that, that he built and he used. So this robot can uh, navigate and explore autonomously in uh, initially unknown environments. And, and then uh, and, and capable of making inference about its surrounding and also be able to uh, adapt unfamiliar situation, even in the presence of erroneous information. Some of the information was given or fit into, the sensor is wrong, but you need to figure out that's wrong information. So just like uh, we, we learned in variance, the system is a dynamic and uncertain and highly complex. So that the one example he demonstrated, and this diagram is a very rough diagram of this, uh, this algorithm that he implementing. There's a lot more details. Uh, for this uh, algorithm so that he actually demonstrated so in this uh, spatial mapping so that this uh, robot would navigate freely going up and down and, and try to build a map here so that this green area, that's the area that has been explored and, and the map has been built, for example. So, uh, okay, this is a very basic, uh, this, the research at this point, but uh, the more focused on algorithmic development. But if this thing uh, can be uh, potentially in the future transitions into Micro air vehicles, for example, you can send out this uh, micro air vehicles and just explore the situation and then build a map and tell us about what I've actually seen. And so uh, that's the down to features that if this uh, it goes successful the next five, 10 years, and maybe we'll be able to have such micro air vehicle systems. And then um, the second example, and, and then th this is a project, it's a lab task project uh, by Dr. Patterson at the Air Force Research Lab. And uh, this is more experimental investigation at this particular point. So he was interested in studying how humans or people learn. Learn means intuitively, without making conscious efforts. Learn the temporal structures by passively observing a series of events unfolding over time, one after another, so that so for example, he using this uh, synthetic terrain images where that you can see the truck and tanks and rocket launches so that he built this artificially so that certain objects appears and then goes out of the screen but they complete control on the, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, graph structures. For example, you may first see a truck and from, you go from the state S0 to S1 and, and sometimes you see the humors and then from, you see another trucks, or well, sometimes not always, okay? So that this, uh, the tree, is a probabilistic uh, figures, okay? So that there's certain structures built in, but there's not until deterministic, probabilistic. So that these things come and go, and then you're supposed to watch for like two hours, and after that, you ask a good question, for example. Now you see this tank, what's gonna come next, for example? So that uh, the question is that this, the data can show here, so that this was the, uh, the the recognition decision so that the baseline is 50%. This, this is control condition. So that in this condition, there's no such temporal sequence structures. And then there's about 50%, half and half. But uh, in, this, in this example, where they, they, they're observing the series of cars and tanks and, and, and this come and goes, and they were not told what was they supposed to simply just 
passively observing, and they're actually the performance, passive viewing condition, they're actually the performance more than chance level. That means that somehow we do pick up certain temporal structures, and we do just unconsciously. This is, this you can call this, this implicit learning, okay? And uh, so uh, this was at this point, it's the experiment investigation, so up to the next, next would be, he wants to build a model, just like uh, the doctor, uh, the, the Griffiths did, and, and that will tell us about how you can actually build a system that can aid our decision making, example. So I wanted to highlight this as, an, as another example. It's done at the uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Okay. And then to briefly we'll talk about some uh, transitional efforts, and, and this is a joint effort with the Air Force Research Lab and uh, George Mason uh, University, uh, so this is a center of excellence. So this is a five years, a multi-million dollar uh, research effort and supported by the, my program. And so there's about 10 researchers involved from the George Mason University and another five or six from the, uh, the Air Force Research Lab in, the, in this topic is neuroeconomics. Ergonomics, I should, I should say, it means that this is a neuroscience approach to human factors research. So that the goal here is, uh, is not just enhance the science they are engaged in, and, uh, but also encourage the, uh, the interaction and research collaboration between efforts research lab scientists and George Mason University uh, the researchers. So actually, this is just, uh, we just finished the first year, so there's a lot happening during the first year, so there's uh, people visiting one another, they are publishing papers together, and, and then also the, uh, as down here as you can see, this is uh, an example of uh, the workforce development. The students, graduate students and postdocs from George Mason University, they would go and spend their summer time in White Patterson University in fact with their scientists. So uh, this, this has been, uh, so far has been very successful and then we're going to second year now here. So I just want to highlight that this is what I call direct transition so that the university researchers and then therefore the lab scientists they are directly engaged in and working on the project and publishing the papers. Okay. And just briefly, uh, other organizations I interact and I interact uh, with my peers at other DOD agency and uh, ONRs and, uh, and uh, NSF and I was go to their program review meetings and also attend their workshop they organize and I write a MUTI uh, proposal together. But in particular, uh, these two, ARO and NSF, um, and these are the two uh, the agency I most closely interact with because our program focus uh, fit well with one another. Just want to mention those program and then PMNS names. These are not exhaustive. And uh, this is uh, my second last slide. And before closing, I want to highlight some recent accomplishment. And remember that I mentioned about the CENTEC, uh, the research initiative, and uh, just recently they, uh, they published a special issue on neuroeconomics in, in the journal called Neuroimage. So this is uh, the top rate, uh, the flagship journals in neuroscience method. And, and it's, it's actually, it was a, it's a couple of pages, you can see. So, so here's a, there's, there's about 12 papers here, about out of 12, about I think it's like a three or four papers actually jointly co-authored between the GMU professors and FRL scientists. This is really working out very well. And that's the first highlight. The second highlight I want to mention is that here uh, the uh, professor Toby Walsh's, and uh, he is uh, one of my PIs under this uh, robust computation intelligence program in down in Australia. And uh, his team, his team member I should say, Dr. Peter Sturkey and the person in this, uh, in the, on the left. And recently he won this uh, Eureka Prize for Innovation in Computer Sciences. And I was told that this is the highest prize in computer sciences in Australia and given annually, given by Google Australia. It comes with a $10,000 cash prize. And so um, here's an example of what that, um, you know, it, it brings out certain breakthroughs. So, but I should, I should also mention that this uh, Dr. Wang Shi, they originally funded through the AORD in the first year and then uh, transitioned to, to, to my program here. So currently he's under my program, but originally started as an AORD project. So the AORD, they, they pick out this Dr. Tom Walsh's. Okay, so this is my last slide. 
So uh, to recap, the basic uh, premise of my investment uh, philosophy is that I view the cognitions or intelligence as a, basically a computational algorithm that require multidisciplinary efforts to uncover that brain algorithm. Once you understand the brain mechanism, and that could, 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 could be uh, used to build autonomous systems. So that requires the computer science, mathematics, statistics, engineering, and psychology, and so on and so forth. So that the down here, with that, here's uh, my um, projection vision into the future. Said that, um, and and I, I like to say, uh, if this my pro program succeed in next ten or twenty years, we might be able to see this uh, potential breakthrough. Is uh, one is a neural computation foundation recognition. This is the holy grails. We may be able to finally figure it out, and, and I think we're almost at the threshold. And, uh, and also maybe able to uh, have this self-supporting, uh, self-learning decision support system. And this is most looks like it comes from machine learning and Bayesian algorithms, some form of it. And then finally, we may be able to build a trustworthy autonomous agency. With that, and thank you very much. And then, uh, any questions? Anybody hear me? No. Okay. Ah, it's on. Any questions? Yes. We'll use this mic because it'll go out. Uh, so, Jay, I, I really love the notion of the grand challenge of unlocking the neural code. Obviously, that's a bunch of Nobel Prizes. Um, and I'm really happy, you know, since it might be in our lifetimes, for you to say that we're on the verge of, of that. Is there a single huge hump that needs to be gotten over, in your opinion, or is it a series of small or medium-sized humps? Can you say anything about the specific problem that, in your opinion, really needs to get solved? I have my personal opinion on this, because that's why I highlight this, uh, this uh, Dr. Lazar, because oftentimes people focus on a single neuron trying to understand the uh, real spikes. And, but his approach is that you have to look at this entire population of uh, the neurons, and because simply just this is an analog to digital converter, so looking at the, what each neuron is doing is, does not tell you much about it. So that is, this is one thing I like about his approaches. Of course, the other people proposing, but Dr. Lazar, he just implemented completely from, from start to scratch and demonstrated the video, video uh, the imaging recovery. That was good, but the question is, is that gonna be enough? Of course, we don't know. I mean, this is, uh, of course, uh, once I know, I would, I'll figure that out myself and <laughs> or quit this job. <laughs> but that's one promising direction. But of course, we don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, Jay, my question is uh, regarding, uh, apart from P Pagnuco's work, uh, principally your work does not address uh, what I'd consider to be contested uh, intellectual environments, that is, ones where your adversary intends to deceive or to uh, in encourage you to mislearn. Um, so my question is, uh, will, will, will Professor Lazar or others' work look at that? Uh, so for example, a classic example in, in psychology is every, every psychology uh, undergraduate does this experiment. Uh, give your mouse negative feedback. That is, you know, put, 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 uh, put uh, you know, cheese behind door number one, train him for a while, and then take it away. Uh, and it turns out actually, you know, so let's trick, trick him, right, and, and then put it back. Right? It turns out actually mice learn quicker. That way. Now that's got, of course, to do the relationship with, with motivation as well as in psychology, uh, even in a mouse, as well as, as, as feedback. But the point is, it's a very critical uh, effect on learning. And unless we look at um, mislearning, uh, and, and importantly, we look at contested environments, um, we won't understand the full uh, implications for, 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 the, for the machine. So I'm just curious, are, are we going to look at misinformation and deception? As in the well. context of the Professor Lazard work? Or, or, or any, of the, any of the portfolio. Oh, okay, so deception is, 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 is oftentimes that, that done in psychology experiments. I mean, there's a lot of tons of data is out there and how, how people learn and behave under these conditions. But if you build the models at this point, I think we're not there yet. None of my PI is actually looking at that one. Yeah, I, that's what I would say, too early. So we're trying to understand the basic cognitive mechanism at this point, not bringing emotions or deception. That's the next, uh, next, next wave.